Welcome to Insight, produced in partnership with Howard University's WHUT. Today we are chatting with Dr. Kurt Newman, President and CEO of the Children's National Health System. Kurt has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Kurt, for joining us today. Well, thank you, Mark. So this organization is so important in this area. Talk about the extent of your operations and your mission. Uh, Children's National is uh, started as a hospital, but it started right after the Civil War. So we've been in operation almost 150 years. It started as a little hospital taking care of the needs of kids at that time. And of course, we've evolved over the decades now into a health system for children. At the heart of it is a hospital, but it's so much more. Uh, we have clinics in parts of the city here in Washington, D.C., where there are not enough doctors and nurses. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, mental health facilities uh, around the city and, and in the region, specialty clinics around the, the region. We work with other hospitals. And when there's areas that we can't get to with a traditional clinic or doctor's offices, we have mobile health. So we have vans that go out to get to the kids. We want to be uh, where the kids are. Uh, we also have a program now with the uh, school system here in the district to provide the school nurses in the school and we can provide a lot of services and contact and access for kids. So the whole goal uh, beyond uh, what people uh, think about you know, when they think of a hospital where we have emergency departments and intensive care units, operating rooms and research and we're training, but it's really a broad integrated system to, to help children and families. Talk about how the organization has evolved as the definitions of health have evolved uh, within your leadership? Well, you know, even thinking about my own personal story, for most of my career, I was a pediatric surgeon. So uh, my uh, life was diagnosing and operating on children, uh, surgical conditions. And you know, one of the things that was different about children though, that I always enjoyed and, and loved about the pediatric world and pediatric specialists and children's hospital was not only were we thinking about the solutions of today, like the problem in front of us, and in my case as a surgeon, you know, what, what's right there, but also thinking about the impact long-term. So what we do today, how is that gonna impact that child? And maybe it's a different operation on a child than it might be in an adult. If you draw that out more widely, and you know, as I thought about becoming a leader and then six years ago became the CEO of the hospital, I really had to think myself on a bigger scale and, and more broadly, well, what are the issues of children? What's really affecting families and how can Children's National play a bigger role uh, in that impact? You know, we're the Children's Hospital here in the nation's capital, so we've got this, in a sense, responsibility to think that way. And as CEO, you're also directing how you invest your expense capital into service, so you are making everyday decisions on where the emphasis should lie and how do you create balanced health for an entire uh, group of, of children in, in, a, in a whole region. Absolutely, and, uh, and there's a big need. And we have some of the biggest uh, uh, disparities in healthcare for children right here in Washington, D.C., whether it's infant mortality, asthma statistics, uh, uh, mental health conditions. So when I was interviewing with the search committee, uh, they knew I was a surgeon in chief of surgery. They said, well, what's the next big frontier for you? And I think it surprised them a little bit uh, when I had been thinking about this, that uh, our uh, identification and our uh, uh, mobilization around mental and behavioral health issues just wasn't where I thought it should be uh, uh, for a children's hospital. And I looked around the country and a lot of the children's hospitals weren't uh, I thought paying as mu much attention to those issues. And even nationally, there wasn't a lot of conversation around that, and it was very interesting. But the board uh, really uh, got excited by that because when you look at the statistics, 20% of children will have some type of mental or behavioral health issue uh, during their childhood. And frequently, they're not recognized. Or even when it's recognized, Mark, it can go be almost eight years from when somebody sees that there's something, an issue, before that uh, child gets treatment. And the uh, interesting thing is, 
is that if you intervene, if you make a, a determination around whether, maybe, whether it's depression, eating disorder, uh, anxiety, uh, autism, if almost everything in pediatrics, if you can identify things early, you can have a better outcome if right. you get on it. And I think the other exciting frontier is that with the research that's coming along in genetics, and if we can identify these things early, we're gonna have treatments and solutions. But back to your question, it is a, a matter of prioritization and balance. So uh, as CEO, uh, we've been able, uh, with my management team and our, our organization, to uh, pivot the investments uh, into more into the community and to build uh, uh, more access and to have uh, uh, mental health providers in our primary care clinics so that they can help when we're screening the kids for mental health issues, we can have a provider right there. Or if we don't have enough, we can use something like telemedicine so we can access that. So the whole key is to tr uh, try and provide uh, more, more access. It's not easy because the reimbursement system, for example, right. does not favor uh, treatment of mental health conditions. Well, you, you, you end up moving into community health and, and creating a, a healthy community. The reimbursement systems are not focused on healthy communities. The reimbursement systems are focused on, I have a broken arm, fix my arm. But what happens if you have um, a child who has gone through so much stress that they go into cycles of depression? You don't see that, but that child is as impacted, perhaps even more impacted, their future is more impacted by this untreated uh, circumstance, this untreated condition. And the reimbursement system really doesn't take that into account. So how do you, how do you navigate that so that you have a financially responsible stewardship of the assets that you are managing, um, yet ensuring that you're doing the right thing when the reimbursement system doesn't incentivize you to do the right thing? Well. Uh the current business model in a lot of markets, uh, and in Washington is one of those, uh, is that you generally get paid in healthcare for doing things, for more procedures, uh, more visits, uh, more prescriptions, more what, tests, what, more, more. more whatever it is. I think there's an emerging consensus that um, as a society, we need to look differently at that and find ways of paying for prevention and avoiding uh, health care costs. And we have a, a number of programs where uh, the, the benefit and the impact is so obvious, uh, where we, uh, and one for example is around asthma. We have one of the highest uh, rates of children coming to the emergency department for asthma uh, in the country. So uh, one of our doctors, Dr. Uh, Stephen Teach, uh, had the idea of, well, Let's look at a visit to the emergency department for a child with asthma uh, as a failure of the system. Yeah, we get paid well for taking care, but let's look at it in a different way. And this is where, uh, for us, philanthropy comes in. So uh, we could take on a program uh, like this, which was designed to decrease emergency room visits uh, because we could support the uh, doctors that in the leaders that were, were doing that. So what happened was, when we identified that a child or a family had come to the emergency department because they're of asthma, that was a failure of the healthcare system. That was a failure. And then we would put more resources on that child and family so that we could uh, uh, prevent that from happening uh, again. And what we've seen is that decreases the uh, incidence of emergency department visits in those kids by 40%. I mean, it's a huge uh, impact. Now we're tying that into the, uh, with the school nurses because we have that access so we can alert uh, them about uh, this child. They have a plan. They can stay on their uh, prevention. And it really is the direction we want to go with, with all of the, uh, many of these chronic diseases, uh, whether it's uh, asthma, whether it's mental health, whether it's prenatal care for mothers uh, with babies, so that they don't uh, need the the hospital. So you're talking about a, an, an operating infrastructure 
that is so much more sophisticated than the, than the, than the traditional sort of hospital administra administrative infrastructure uh, that you previously had. That, that's right, and uh, a key to that is going beyond the uh, hospital and our health system itself and looking for partnerships, collaborators in the community uh, to help build an ecosystem because it's not a, um, a narrow set of, of issues that's just defined by health but it gets into education and the schools. You have to go out of your own comfort zone, you have, the, the comfort zone of your staff. Ab absolutely, so you know, I was getting out of my comfort zone being a surgeon getting into the C-suite, but uh, now it's a, you know, in the neighborhoods and you know, where does nutrition come in or where does uh, housing uh, is a critical uh, I issue. And then working with others uh, and other organizations to provide uh, the support and framework uh, for these children and these families to succeed. If you talk about children um, on a on a um, on a continuum of of prosperity, um, with um, your services to very poor children, or children from poor families, and very and children from very wealthy families, how does that curve look in terms of who you serve? Uh, one of the ways of, of looking at it is that over half the children we care for are on Medicaid. Over so half. Over half. 55%. Over half receive public assistance. Uh, for their health care. For their health care. And that's usually, uh, uh, you know, a, a marker of, of poverty. And it provide, it's such an important program uh, because it does provide access for these children. And it's a very good uh, program. Uh, and we work with three different states, Maryland, um, uh, the District of Columbia and Virginia, and uh, the uh, what 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 you see there. It's such a important program. Yet, the conversation is troubling with around health policy because a lot of people don't understand necessarily how important that program is for the health of children, whether it's prevention and providing, and it's very efficient because if kids get the prevention. And if they get the uh, care they need uh, for some of these uh, potentially chronic diseases, we can prevent a lot of the costs uh, in the future. If you uh, are on top of a mental health condition or getting asthma early or obesity, diabetes, uh, we can prevent a lot of the adult uh, 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 manifestations of, of that and complications. So it's really uh, a, co a very cost-effective investment and that's what's so frustrating sometimes and that's that's the key there th th there seems sometimes to be a conversation as if the choice is between spending or not spending and and that's not the conversation it's it's spending a little now or spending more later or spending a lot more a lot more later Right, so it, it, it and it goes directly with this kind of early in intervention funding. Yes, I I, uh, I think you uh, articulated that uh, beautifully because we are going to spend on these issues. It's just a matter of when and and how much. And my view is uh, if we do it early. I want to come back to something though. Uh, these issues are not just the uh, issues of uh, children, you know, without resources or on, on Medicaid. And so the, the mental health issues and behavioral health issues are just as prevalent uh, in families with uh, uh, lots of resources. It's just that they tend to have, uh, those families and tend to have more access uh, uh, to getting uh, treatment. So there is that uh, disparity. So you wrote um, the book, Healing Children, and the proceeds are going to? To research, uh, you know, I'm so passionate about doing more research for children and their issues. So that was where one of the resources to go. But the, the real uh, drive behind writing a book was to empower parents and, and society on a larger scale about the special value of pediatric medicine, specialists, hospitals, this world that I've lived in that I know. And I know that if and feel that if people knew more about it, they would come to some of the same conclusions I've come to over the years, but it's told through stories from my career as a surgeon and now CEO. Well, it's a great, great service that you provide to the children of this area, 
um, and a great perspective. And thank you so much for sharing your stories as a surgeon as a, and as a hospital administrator. Dr. Kurt Newman of the Children's National Health System, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us and your experiences, and thank you for your insights. Well, thank you. It's great.